In this video, we're going to look at how to use diagrams to draw conclusions. So now that you know your mini proofs um, and you know what you can conclude, now we're going to look at well, what happens if you're just given a piece of information and you have to make up the conclusion. So if I look at the first example here, I'm given right angles. So you want to think about your mini proofs. Whenever you were given right angles, there's really two conclusions that you can make. So first of all, we always want to label our diagram. So angle E and angle B are right angles. So there's two conclusions I can make from that. One of them being that these two angles have to be congruent because all right angles are congruent. So I can make that conclusion. I can say angle E is congruent to angle B. And the reason for that is because all right angles are congruent. Or another conclusion I can make is I can say, well, that makes those two triangles right triangles. So I'm going to go ahead and add that as another conclusion. I could say triangle DEF and triangle ABC are right triangles. And the reason why they're both right triangles is because a triangle with one right angle implies a right triangle or is a right triangle. So notice I'm not actually writing a formal proof but I'm using my given and then this would be like the next step that I could write in my proof. So instead of rewriting our given I'm just looking at well what conclusion can I make and making sure that I'm always marking my diagram is so important for this. So if we look at number two, now I'm given that I have a midpoint. So if I was given that in a proof, well, what conclusion could you make from that? So D is the midpoint of EC. So D is in the middle of segment EC, which means that these two parts have to be equal since D is in the middle dividing the segment into two congruent parts. So my conclusion that I can make from this given is the fact that those two segments were congruent. Whatever you mark in your diagram is usually what you're concluding. So ED is congruent to CD. So there's my conclusion. Why can I make that conclusion? What reason did we use in our mini proofs? Well, we said if we have a midpoint, that implies two congruent segments. Or a midpoint divides a segment into two congruent parts. There's lots of ways that you can explain this. So the main thing is if you're given a midpoint, you should be concluding that you have two congruent segments. That's what that piece of information is telling you. If we look at the next one, we're given an angle bisector. We're bisecting angle BAD. So we have to look at the angle itself that's being bisected. So it's BAD. So if that angle is being bisected, the parts that are going to be congruent are these two parts here. So it's the parts that make up the whole angle. So I'm going to just put angle 1 and angle 2 in there. I think it'll just make it easier to talk about it. But those two angles, angle 1 and angle 2, have to be congruent because AC is the segment that's splitting that angle into two congruent parts. So if I'm given a bisector, I should be looking for what two parts are equal. So in this case, we have angle 1 is congruent to angle 2. And the reason for that is an angle bisector. implies two congruent angles. So again, I looked at what was I given, what conclusion can I make. Looking at the next one here, we're given a perpendicular bisector. So we're given a triangle, we have some information about what's being drawn, and we see that AG is a perpendicular bisector of DE. Well, first of all, I don't have AG in the problem, so I think this is supposed to say FG. I think that's a typo. So let's go ahead and just fix that. So FG is the perpendicular bisector of DE. So that means you have two things to consider here. We have perpendicular and we have bisector. So if we have FG and DE are perpendicular, you should be thinking right angles. You should be marking right angles. So I'm going to go ahead and mark right angles, and I'm going to number those. You could use three letters, I like to just number them. So I could say angle one and angle two are right angles. And you can just say a perpendicular bisector 
implies right angles. Or you could say a perpendicular bisector implies perpendicular lines and perpendicular lines form right angles, something like that. Or perpendicular bisector implies perpendicular lines and then add to that, then say that you have the right angles. Um, anything along those lines. You could also say angle one and angle two are congruent because angle um, all right angles are congruent. You could say that you have right triangles here. So there's a lot of conclusions that I can make from the fact that I have a perpendicular bisector. So I could go further with this and say that that makes those congruent. So let's go ahead and do that um, because the directions at the top of the page actually say what are the congruent parts. So once I have the right angles, well now I can say well that makes them congruent because all right angles are congruent. So that would be a conclusion that I can make knowing that I had a perpendicular bisector. Remember, you could also mention right triangles here. So there's lots of things. So really, the goal is, given what we have, mark our diagram, and what conclusion can we make? What step would come in our proof? If we look at the other part of this, the bisector part, well, what does a bisector do? Well, a bisector, depending on if it's an angle bisector or segment bisector, is going to divide that angle or segment into two equal parts. So if you're bisecting DE, that means this segment right here is getting divided into two equal parts. So that's a conclusion I can make. I can say DG is congruent to segment EG. And my reason for that is if you have a perpendicular bisector, that's going to give you two congruent segments. So there you go. So there's another conclusion. So all from that one given. And again, these are kind of like parts that would become part of our proof. They're the pieces of our proof with these as given. So in your proof, you'd actually write the given again, but we're just looking at what conclusions can we come up with? What pieces could we add to our proof? So then I look at this last one here, and now I'm given a couple of things. So angle one is congruent to angle two, and then I have angle one is also congruent to angle three. So right away, I look at this as I see a repeated angle. So this should be a red flag that substitution is occurring here because if you have two angles that are equal to the same angle, those two angles are going to be equal to each other. And even if you look at my picture here, one and two were congruent, so I used single arcs. But then because I was using one again, I can stick with using a single arc. And since that's congruent to three, well, now I see all three angles have single arcs, which makes all three angles congruent to each other. So... For this one, what I can also say that's not already stated is angle 2 and angle 3 must also be congruent, and that's by substitution. You could also say um, transitive property. You could say angles that are congruent to the same angle must be congruent to each other. So those are all different ways of basically stating the same thing. So go ahead and try to check your understanding. You basically remember doing looking at the givens, marking your diagrams, and figuring out what conclusion can you make. Like number four here, sometimes there's more than one conclusion. Sometimes you might write that there's right triangles. Someone else might say that there's congruent right angles. Someone else might just state that there's right angles. So you're not wrong. So when you're doing these, you're just trying to make a conclusion from the given. It's to help us later on build these proofs by piecing together all this important information. So work on the next page and just work on getting conclusions based on the givens. So mark your diagrams, make a conclusion, and then we will talk about those tomorrow.